And next up, we have Margaret Berta, who is currently an undergraduate here at the University of Notre Dame. She's majoring in biochemistry and political science. And she's been working in Dr. Mario Lieberman's lab, also here at Notre Dame, uh, to help develop pharmaceutical analytical devices that provide rapid and cost-effective detection of substandard pharmaceuticals in developing countries. And she's currently in a coordinating role uh, within the Distributed Pharmaceutical Analysis Lab uh, that she is going to talk more about here uh, in the use of the Open Science Framework. So good morning, my name is Margaret Berta, and today I'll be talking about my work um, to improve the Distributed Pharmaceutical Analysis Lab using the Open Science Framework. So the Distributed Pharmaceutical Analysis Lab, or DPAL, is aimed at addressing the problem of substandard pharmaceuticals, particularly in developing countries. This map shows cases of reported substandard pharmaceuticals um, between 2007 and 2012, and as you can see, there's a large number in developing countries. Um, the World Health Organization um, estimates that more than 30% of pharmaceuticals sold in developing countries are falsified or substandard. And to determine if a pharmaceutical is substandard is considered um, a medication ha that has less than 90% of the active pharmaceutical ingredient in the uh, pharmaceutical. So this problem of substandard pharmaceuticals is often, often a result of inadequate post-market quality control. And so there are four main factors um, in ineffective um, pharmaceutical regulation, and that's inadequate funding, um, inadequately trained personnel, um, in access to analytical resources, and a lack of governmental support. Um, typically, pharmaceuticals are analyzed using high-performance liquid chromatography, which is a technique that um, the instrumentation is upwards of $30,000 or $30,000 and it's typically using techniques um, that are taught to uh, chemistry students in an advanced undergraduate setting. Additionally, the um, technique requires very constant um, environmental conditions. So in areas where there's um, electrical problems where the electricity goes down or in access to pure water, there can be significant problems in conducting this analysis. So the Distributed Pharmaceutical Analysis Lab was created to address these problems. Um, there are secret shoppers in developing countries such as Kenya, which sample pharmaceuticals and send them to the University of Notre Dame. Um, the University of Notre Dame then acts as a clearinghouse and sends them to different institutions around the country, which conduct the pharmaceutical analysis. Any samples that are found to be substandard are then sent back to the University of Notre Dame for further testing. And if the sample is continually found to be substandard, it's reported to medical regulatory agencies such as the World Health Organization or the Kenya Pharmacy and Poisons Board. So when we were working on a program set up to um, enable collaborative um, analysis, we had four main considerations. And this was data security, communication, um, effective data sharing, and usability of the site. We found that um, the Open Science Framework was a great platform for this. Um, as it was a free platform that encouraged open and transparent data sharing. So our first major concern was data security, and we've addressed this using the Open Science Framework registrations features, which allows us to create a snapshot of the program in time. So it's a non-editable version that can serve as an additional backup, and it's a citable reference for that, the program at that particular point in time when a report is being made. Additionally, we have addressed the issue of communication by creating a sort of internal peer review system by utilizing the various levels of access that the OSF um, allows. So, for example, an individual at Hamlin University has their own component page. This component, for this component, they have read and write access to the entire page, but they only have read only access to every other component, including other participants such as Grandview University or the DPAL program page. This allows them to review other institutions work and provide a sort of peer review and proofreading, um, but they're unable to edit any of the data. If they find any problems with the data, they can use the commenting feature to notify DPAL of any issues. So the next aspect that we address was data sharing. Now, since DPAL data can potentially be used in lawsuits against manufacturers, it's imperative that all data, both spreadsheets, 
chromatograms and all information regarding um, the method being used and the validation for that method be stored and easily accessible. So institution components, such as the Notre Dame institution component, is where all this hard data is posted. Once an institution has cumulative results, which is the quantified amount of active pharmaceutical ingredient in a sample, it then submits the final results to the DPEL project page using restricted access forms. So the restricted access forms are emailed to the participants. And then once they fill out the form, the information is pre-populated onto view-only spreadsheets. These spreadsheets are then visible for all participants in the program, but can only be accessed by DPAL administrators. So in order to maintain high quality data sharing, it's very important that everybody that's working on the project knows exactly what they're doing both from an analytical standpoint and that they understand the science behind it, but also from an administrative standpoint that they know how the program works, how they upload the information and what they can and cannot do with respect to the data and the results that are posted. So we've, we have created informational resources for specific target audiences. So DPEL is intended primarily for educational purposes in analytical chemistry labs. So we have resources such as light videos, like more videos for students, which details the um, chemistry behind the science that they're doing. In addition, we have um, standardized spreadsheets and an HPLC methodology manual for instructors, which um, is used for data collection and, is, and provides the guidelines for how to use the open science framework. So in conclusion, a brief assessment of where DPEL is so far. Um, we believe we've established a good foundation for the system. Um, obviously, there's room for improvement as we continue to grow and expand and new um, issues come to our attention. But the biggest problem that we have faced is that people need to actually adopt the system that we've created. Um, it's, we're sort of in like the rolling out stage right now, and we need people to begin using the program as part of their daily analytical procedure. Um, to really have an effective program with um, the open science framework. So with that, are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm looking at your page on the open science. So that, so the different institutions each like get the particular. Yeah, so we receive about 18 different active pharmaceutical ingredient um, medications. And when a <laughs> organization um, contacts us about um, being part of DPAL, um, we take into account both their preference as to what they want to work on, but also what we need um, them to work on because these pharmaceuticals do expire. And so, for example, we have, um, you know, albendazole is one of them that expires rather quickly. And so when a new group comes to us, we ask them if they can do that so that we can keep those samples moving through before they expire. So is there a way, um, okay, I, see I'm ignorant as to what it so like, so for instance, if I were interested in amoxicillin, do mm -hmm. I have to know that UCSB did it, or is there some place where all of the results get like? Yeah, so on the main DPAL project page, there's a DPAL cumulative results spreadsheet where all the, you can search the results by the active pharmaceutical ingredient, but each school has their own um, component where their raw data is kept. So um, when they submit their results, they indicate like what institution they're from. And so then you can like backtrack um, through that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So each of the, uh, the institutional components, mm -hmm. do they have specialties? So for instance, UCSB has a specialty in certain types of um, knowledge of certain medicines or certain components, or is it something that you distributed around anybody who do anything? How does that work in terms of the workflow? Yes, so each institution typically has one to two um, medications that they work on. So for example, here in Notre Dame, we work primarily with amoxicillin and amoxiclav, um, but other institutions only focus on, for example, albendazole. And so each institution has their focus, but there are multiple institutions that will work on the same drug um, if we have a large number of that, that sample. Any more questions for Margaret? Thank you, Margaret. Thank you.